Hey, good afternoon to you. It is 5.06 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up from the Heritage Foundation, Kevin Roberts, the president of Heritage, will be with us at 5.30. We'll talk to him about all of the important policy issues that should be a part of a presidential campaign. Kamala Harris is flipping all over the place right now with her policies, whatever they might be. She told CNN today, my values have not changed, whatever that means. And uh, CNN is slowly rolling out now some of the excerpts from this interview today. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Um, we're getting uh, Jason Miller. He's with the Trump campaign. He he posted to X in the last hour that uh, apparently the, the actual interview portion of tonight's Kamala Harris sit down is something like 18 minutes long. Now, I don't know how he knows that, but that's what he claims that he's hearing and that we're not going to be getting a full transcript from CNN, apparently. We'll see if uh, that holds true. Now, if it is only 18 minutes, I, I guess, first of all, that's awful. That is awful. With two people sitting in front of Dana Bash, what a waste of everybody's time. You can't get into anything meaningful uh, in that short amount of time. And that's obviously going to be the point if it's a short interview like that. Something, my suspicion about all of this, because I've been watching, CNN has been over the course of each hour over the last two hours, so four o'clock and five o'clock, top of the show, top of the hour, in their A block, they've been showing tiny little clips from the interview, and that's it. And then, as Dana Bash is talking to the host on CNN about what was it like talking to her, what'd you find out? And she doesn't really tell you anything because they want you to watch later. On the side of the screen, right on the, the B roll footage that they have on screen, is lots of footage of Dana Bash just like on Air Force Two. Talking to Kamala, like smiling, the two of them chuckling and exchanging some sort of non-news specific conversation. Or they're hanging out in a restaurant. There she is with Tim Walls and and Kamala Harris. My guess tonight is what we're gonna get is a whole an hour basically of of some interview and then a lot of just fluff. A lot of just like, oh, and here they are. They're doing the and they call it on like on 60 minutes when they have when they film these things. And you have the guest walking with you, like through a hallway. It's called a walk and talk. That's what it's called. So they, they walk around and it looks like they're doing something. And they literally script these things usually. Like, like okay, you two walk down this hallway and make it look like you're talking about something. And you and you look at each other and you gesture. You're like, nub, 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 nub. and you kind of move your mouth. You can, you can just say the word watermelon 15 times. Nobody will know the difference. Just keep saying watermelon, 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 watermelon. And as you're walking down the hallway... And, and they just need the, the visual of you having this in-depth conversation. They don't actually need a real in-depth conversation. We're not capturing a natural moment. We're going to manufacture that. We just need it for the television screen. So that's, I, I think that's where we're headed. I think this is where this is going. And uh, Kamala Harris, the second clip that they've released today is this claim uh, that uh, she's going to appoint a Republican. She'd be open to a Republican in her cabinet, a Republican. It'd be wonderful to have a Republican because she's for diverse thoughts, she said. She's for diverse thoughts, uh, which is not true at all. And the Republicans she's talking about are like Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney. You know, it's not, this is like, she's not looking for diversity of thought here. She's just looking for team players. Uh, the other thing that's going to be released, my guess is at the top of this next hour, but it's already in CNN's written coverage today is she was asked about uh, President Trump at the National Association of Black Journalists raising the fact that Kamala Harris has been a chameleon throughout her entire career, and she's represented herself at various points in her political career as like completely different races. And Trump, President Trump raised this because he knew, instinctively he knew, that this would be the kind of thing that would kick the hornet's nest, Right. But President Trump, he brought up, he said, uh, you know, for, forever. She was just saying she was Indian. And then all of a sudden she's saying she's black. He goes, I don't happen to care. I like both of them. I'm paraphrasing. I'm just remembering off the top of my head. He goes, I don't care. I like both of them. But somebody should ask her about that. So Dana Bash apparently today asked some some version of a, of a question about this. And of course it was like, let me see. Let me see how they described it. Um, oh, here's it's the very last two sentences of CNN's write up online. She summarily dismissed Trump's assertion made last month at a conference for black journalists that she had altered her racial identity over time. Quote, 
Same old tired, pl tired playbook, Kamala said. Next question, please. So there you go. So that'll be the next clip that I'm sure they're going to release. They haven't released it yet. They've just written that down. But here comes the clip. They're going to release it. Um, today, you know, there's a, a lot of people who had their own ideas about what CNN should ask. Among them was uh, from the Trump campaign, Caroline Levitt was on, this was on CNN, right? Caroline, yeah, she was on CNN and she suggested this today. She had some suggestions that she shared on the air. I haven't been able to talk to President Trump yet this morning because he is calling in to media interviews, unlike Kamala Harris, who has av been avoiding the press for more than 40 days. And we're excited that CNN finally has the opportunity to question Kamala Harris tonight about her disastrous record. And we hope that Data Bash, and we're confident that she will, will ask tough questions of Kamala Harris's record. Because again, Americans aren't concerned with social media. Oh yeah, D didn't pre President Trump put out a truth social Social post this morning that was really nice to Dana Bash just this morning he was like and, and I don't have it in front of me but it was super encouraging it was like it was like you know she has a real chance to make a to make a real mark on the industry it's gonna be wonderful if she does that that would be a, a really a really big deal and it could it could be so good for her career oh I do have it let me read it this is funny whereas I'm looking for it right now oh here he is yeah, President Trump this morning, 9.58 this morning, posted, Dana Bash of CNN has a chance at greatness today. If she gave a fair but tough interview of comrade Kamala Harris, she will expose her as being totally inept and ill-suited for the job of president, much as I exposed crooked Joe Biden during our now famous debate. How cool would that be for Dana and CNN? Three question marks. Also, the interview should not have Tampon Tim present to help with the inevitable Kamala stumbles. And under no circumstances should the transcript be allowed to be changed in any way, shape, or form. Dana and Jake were fair but firm in my CNN debate with Crooked Joe. This is a chance for Dana Bash to reach real stardom while at the same time doing a great service to our now failing country. Good luck, Dana. Do the right thing. Three exclamation points, DJT. <laughs> I, uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, he knows how to write a truth social post. Really, really fantastic. So there he is being very encouraging to Dana. This is your big shot. You should do it. Go for it. Impress the country. So so Caroline Levitt was on CNN and she and she adopted the campaign line. She said, yeah, this is a great chance for Dan. I hope she, I know she's going to ask tough questions. She'll do it. She's got it in her. Americans aren't concerned with social media posts and silly memes. They are concerned with the problems that are plaguing them and their families right now. And they need and deserve answers to the questions of Kamala Harris. Does she still support a ban on fracking? Does Kamala Harris still support eliminating cash bail for violent criminals? Does Kamala Harris still support decriminalizing illegal immigration? And again, I ask, and I hope CNN will ask Kamala Harris this tonight, does she why Did does she you, believe she deserves a promotion when she has been responsible for the failures of the past four years? Did, yeah. Why promote her? And wh why are you pretending like you haven't been in office uh, when this has been the Biden-Harris administration? Kamala Harris, it was they were bragging about it last year when they didn't think she was going to be the nominee, is responsible for the most tie-breaking votes in the United States Senate in history. No other vice president has broken more ties in the Senate than Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is not some distant ceremonial mascot for the administration. She's not the ribbon cutter, the baby kisser. She probably doesn't even like babies. In fact, she campaigns routinely on that. She's, she's a big abortion enthusiast. But when it comes to her role in the administration, she's been as involved and as important and as pivotal as any vice president of our lifetimes. The Biden agenda is something that Harris completely owns. The spending bills that they rammed through with just the single votes, those single votes were Kamala. She was the tie-breaking vote. From the very beginning, from the, the uh, American Rescue Plan to the Inflation Reduction Act, all this garbage, it's her. She did that. She did that. And it's the reason why things are so expensive now. And it's the, we the reason why people are poorer than they were when uh, Joe Biden took office. Kamala Harris owns that. And a real interview would address these points. And so far, what we've seen is nothing like that out of CNN, the limited uh, clips we've seen. Uh, and so, so for now, you know, we wait. We wait to see if anything uh, important comes out of this. Uh, like I said, Kevin Roberts is going to be joining us from the Heritage Foundation uh, coming up. Um, you know, we've got and we've got endless tape 
of Kamala Harris's actual policy declarations. Uh, Dana Bash in, it didn't, as far as we can tell, ask about them in any succinct way. I mean, listen to Kamala talking uh, just through the years. Nonpartisan GovTrack has rated you as the most liberal senator. I am prepared to get rid of the filibuster to pass a Green New Deal. There's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. Would you ban offshore drilling? Yes. What is the solution for voters in the fossil fuel industry? Giving the workers an ability to transition. We're not going to treat people who are undocumented across the border as criminals. That's correct. Raise your hand if you think it should be a civil offense rather than a crime across the border without documentation. Abolish ICE. Yeah, is that a position you agree with? And we need to probably think about starting from scratch. Outdated, it is wrong-headed thinking to think that the only way you're going to get communities to be safe is to put more police officers on the street. Would you support changing the dietary guidelines? The, yes. The, you know, the food pyramid. What the people yes. Are to yes. To reduce red meat specifically. Yes. People who are convicted in prison, like the Boston Marathon bombers, on death row, people who are convicted of sexual assault, they should be able to vote? I think we should have that conversation. We have to have a buyback program, and I support a mandatory buyback program. So for people out there who like their insurance, well, they don't get to keep it. Let's eliminate all of that. Let's move on. I am opposed to any policy that would deny any human being public health, period. That she means for illegals in that, in that last item. She means for illegals. You know, so now, once again, this is left to, you know who this is left to? If CNN can't do it, which they can, apparently, they haven't released any good clips that show them actually getting to the bottom of anything with Kam uh, Kamala Harris. Just words out. You know, who, you know whose job it is now? Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the only interviewer left. He's the last line of defense. President Trump is going to be debating her on September 10th on ABC. Today, ABC announced that they're going to use the same rules as that CNN debate with Joe Biden back in June. And what that means is Kamala Harris, according to ABC, will be forced to use her very own brain for the debate. She will not be allowed to have a cheat sheet in front of her. She's got to do it on her own. It's big girl time. It's big girl time. And she's got to step up to the plate. See if she can do it. And and this is, you know, again, if CNN's going to fail at this, it really leaves it to President Trump to raise all of these issues during the debate, to hit her in the face with it and say, answer for this. You wanted to ban fracking. You want to ban the internal combustion engine. You want to ban people's automobiles. You want to seize people's guns. A mandatory buyback is gun confiscation. That's what that means. You want to give illegal aliens the precious treasure of American citizens which is owed to them. You have made inflation as bad as it's ever been. The cost of goods as high as they've ever been. You need to own that, Kamala, because you're responsible for it. All right, hold on. All right, let's go to the phones. Line one, I've got Frank calling in from Falls Church. Frank, good afternoon, sir. You're on the Vince Colonnais Show. Hey, Vince, thanks so much for taking my call. My pleasure. Hey, so I'm... I'm you keep uh, this is the second day we're talking at least and talking about uh, how Kamala's had the record number of uh, tying vote breaking in the House in the Senate. And I can't help but think of why that happened, the root cause of why she's having to break all of these votes. And it just makes me think about January 5th and the lead up to all of that in 2020 when Trump was not even encouraging people to vote in Georgia, which helped the Democrats get those last two seats in the Senate, mm -hmm. and that is why Kamala is having to break all these votes. And, I, and I'm just worried about all these down-ballot races now, like the governor in North Carolina is down 16 points. And are you worried about these down-ballot races and Trump and, you know, all the effects that he's had on all these races? Um, I uh, Yeah, I think that, that Trump, well, first of all, Trump's doing very well. So I think as far as voters are concerned, they like Trump. And I think it is key. I think Trump, if anything, is going to lift up the Republican candidates that are underneath him on the ballot this year. But to, on your point about Georgia, I pretty vehemently agree with you. I think that this this was a catastrophic mistake, the way that Georgia special election was handled. Donald Trump had every right and, in fact, the ob obligation to bring up his concerns about the way elections are conducted uh, in a lot of places, in a lot of really close states, including Georgia. But it, I, I don't blame Trump quite as much as I blame some of the other cartoon characters who were around that race. Do you remember that, was the, that attorney Lynn Wood was out there 
telling people, don't even vote. Your vote's not going to count on January uh, 5th, that special election. And that's how you end up with John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock in Georgia. So, uh, Frank, your point is very well taken. This is one of those things. It didn't have to be this way, but it is. And insofar as we're talking about Kamala Harris, uh, she owns the catastrophe of this administration, despite her efforts to run away from it, don't you think? I lay it at Trump's feet because I remember him telling people not to vote because it wasn't he was mm. telling the elections are no integrity. And if it wasn't for him, I don't, I don't think we would have Kamala would be breaking these ties. We I, wouldn't have a tie. I have a we would pretty have a good Republican majority. I have a pretty good memory of this. I don't remember him ever telling people not to vote on the January 5th uh, election. Uh, but but well, there sure were people who, the case. who said that. He well, wasn't helping the cause. OK, but raising concerns about the way an election is conducted is totally in bounds. That's not out of bounds. And so. Uh, but again, I agree with you. But what what do you think of Kamala, though? You, you have to agree. She owns Joe Biden's record. Oh, I agree. All those votes. Yeah, she should be uh, held to the feet of the fire for all of those yeah, yeah. votes. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. no, I, 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 I share your concern about uh, self-defeat. I don't like that at all. And uh, you should do everything you can to put yourself in the best possible position. I agree with you there. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. Smart call. Um, all right. Uh, coming up, we're going to be chatting with... Kevin Roberts of the Heritage Foundation, get his reaction to whatever whatever you call what's coming out of Kamala Harris's mouth today in this CNN interview. Uh, she's asked about her policy flip-flops. She says her values haven't changed. What values is she referring to? We we'll ask Kevin Roberts. It's all ahead on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, good afternoon to you. It is 434. Make that 534 here on News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are, as always, making sense of the news. You can join us today at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. The uh, first clips are coming out from CNN's conversation with Kamala Harris. And uh, they asked her in a very roundabout way, hey, why are you changing all your policy positions? Here's what that sounded like. Generally speaking, how should voters look at some of the changes that you've made, uh, that you've explained some of here uh, in your policy? Is it because you have more experience now and you've learned more about the information? Is it because you were running for president in a Democratic primary? And should they feel comfortable and confident that what you're saying now is going to be your policy moving forward? Dana, I think the, the, the most important and most significant aspect of my policy perspective and decisions is my values have not changed. You mentioned the Green New Deal. I have always believed, and I have worked on it, that the climate crisis is real, that it is an urgent matter to which we should apply metrics that include holding ourselves to deadlines around time. We did that with the Inflation Reduction Act. We have set goals for the United States of America and, by extension, the globe around when we should meet certain standards for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, as an example. That value has not changed. My value around what we need to do to secure our border, that value has not changed. I spent two terms as the Attorney General of California prosecuting transnational criminal organizations, violations of American laws regarding the passage, illegal passage of guns, drugs, and human beings across our border. My values have not changed. Wow. Listen to that. Listen to the policy depth we just heard. Uh, for more on this, let's uh, turn to Heritage Foundation President Kevin Roberts. Uh, Kevin, great as always to have you with us, sir. Man, it's a pleasure, Vince. I just I just wish to be unburdened by what has been <laughs> with the vice president's rhetoric. Uh, Lord have mercy. That's awful. I, uh, I I really just have no idea what she believes. And I love and I love that she, the line she's repeating here in this answer is uh, my values have not changed. My values have not changed. My values have not changed. I'm not even sure what that means, but I can definitely tell you that her policies are all over the place, aren't they? Well, they are. And and I would just say I don't I actually take her at a word. Her values have not changed because she doesn't have any. Yeah. I don't like saying that about another human, but it's true. She's untethered to anything related to truth or I mean, maybe she's somewhat tethered to kind of uh, Marxist ideology. But even that, it's just sort of objectively hard to tell. But she is all over the place. And I think the reason she's all over the place is because of the policy disaster that has been the Biden-Harris regime. 
Sure. And we are in the closing weeks of an election. Uh, she is the brand new nominee and she's trying to figure this out as she goes along. How do I convince people to like me? Uh, and uh, suddenly she's starting to sound in a lot of respects like her opponent. She says she's for a wall now. She says for, she's for no tax on tips. Have you ever seen a political candidate candidate this rapidly change their position so dramatically? I have never seen anything like this. I mean, this whole campaign has been unique, right? But I've never seen two two aspects of the the Harris campaign thus far. The first is this this fantasy land creation, this transformation that her accomplices in the media have created. Remember, just four or five months ago, we were talking about whether she would remain on the Biden ticket this year. But the second thing is the, this this flip flopping, and you know whether it is energy, whether it's the economy. Yeah whether it's national security and foreign policy, if you're the average voter, you don't know where she stands. And I actually think that's not going to change. I think she's going to continue to try to smile and cackle her way through this campaign. And what worries me a little bit is that unless people in the media, yourself accepted, obviously, actually ask the hard follow-up questions about what your policy positions really are and how they affect the American dream, she might just get away with it. Right, right. So, okay, so she says she's for fracking now. She's once again for the internal combustion engine. She's for building a wall. She's no tax on tips. Has she, have uh, You can share with us here exclusively. It's okay. Has she reached out to the Heritage Foundation for any other policy advice? No, she hasn't. But, you know, although she, she probably wouldn't admit it, it <laughs> honest to God, we have we have we have sent her and President Biden a copy of Mandate for Leadership. We do that for every major candidate. We offered a policy briefing. They've not taken us up on that. But maybe just maybe if she keeps sounding like the Heritage <laughs> Foundation, she might want to give me a call. You should crack that open and start checking it off like a bingo card. OK, well, she's doing this one now. Uh, it seems it, with each passing day, it's really it really is amazing. But what it gets to at its core, and I think you've indicated this in a number of ways, is her integrity. It's it, it's she'll say literally anything that she she lacks a, a true north uh, here. And as you pointed out, when she says that my values have not changed, I, I completely agree with you. This is not a woman who you think of as having values. Uh, this is a woman who is desperately clawing at power and doing whatever she can, saying whatever she has to to get there. Well, that's right. And I guess if there's one consistent point of or aspect of her values, it's that power is good for her and her elite friends. Power is good for the radical left, especially if it's concentrated in Washington, D.C. And this is why over the last few weeks, as we at Heritage have been trying to figure out what can we do to, to from a, a, a policy ideas point of view, help the American voters, give them some resources as they're contemplating their decision. Yeah. We came up with this wonderful website, dangerouslyliberal.com, because that gives people the actual evidence, the actual substance of what Harris has done in her performance as vice president. Dangerouslyliberal.com. Uh, and, and people go there and they uh, can find out more about what actually occurred. I've, I've been talking uh, over the last two days in particular about the fact that it was as, as late as December, the lefty media was crowing about the fact that Kamala Harris is responsible for more tie-breaking votes than any vice president in American history. Any. Uh, and if you actually look at what she's voted on and then you look at the state of our country, you start to realize those two things are very much uh, connected, aren't they, Kevin Roberts? Oh, my gosh. They're they're completely connected. If you think about what a lot of sort of unaffiliated centrist voters were thinking when they voted for Biden-Harris in 2020, I'm just talking about this from a policy point of view. They expected a more moderately liberal form of governance. What they got was – very surprising to them in, in how radical it was on the, the misnomer of the Inflation Reduction Act, on the misnomer of the Green New Deal, both of which, of course, undermine the American dream and prosperity. Harris has been a vital part of that, not just in the obvious ways of being the vice president, but also, as you point out, Vince, in casting those tie-breaking votes. And, and, and that actually, I can tell you from the inside here, you know, as I sit in my office and can almost hit the Capitol with a rock, for those of us who are fighting against those pieces of legislation on policy grounds, the recognition that she was going to cast that vote the wrong way, from my perspective, absolutely led to some of the worst, most damaging policies in modern American history. Yeah. So and we're living uh, through them now, uh, which is which is a disaster. So this uh, so this Kamala Harris campaign, uh, it continues to to barrel forward. And uh, I'd. 
And again, she's really not answering very many questions. I, I, I guess, I mean, I, you're an historian too. When you, when in, in American history, this seems like it's pretty unprecedented. I know, uh, I think it was William McKinley at one point campaigned from his, from his porch. I think that was about, it, it was kind right. of a lazy campaign uh, strategy. If you wanted to hear him, you had to go to him. Uh, but for the most part, uh, this is pretty unprecedented, isn't it? No, it is. It's it. You know, I, I never thought we would see anything worse than Biden's basement campaign in right. 2020. But even Biden in 2020 was much more available to the press. And you know, since you gave me permission to speak as a historian, I will. <laughs> you're you're absolutely right about William McKinley. But at least in the case of McKinley in the 1896 and 1900 campaigns, he was on his porch. You could walk up to his porch and ask him questions, and he would answer your questions substantively about his policy positions. Right, yeah, as opposed to uh, Joe Biden is protected by Secret Service on the beach right now, doing nothing but staring at the waves, and uh, Kamala Harris uh, does uh, what it seems, which already sounds like, it's quite unfortunate, because I was hoping for better, a, a mediocre uh, CNN interview, uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't know why you and Hugh Hewitt both of you friends and great commentators had high hopes for Dana Bash to actually perform <laughs> a great interview. I mean, we've, I don't mean that personally towards her, obviously. I have no animus to her, another person, but just in terms of her pattern, she's grossly anti Trump. She's grossly unfair. Now, we've only seen this one clip, but based on this, these two minutes, I'm not sure the other 16 minutes are going to be much better. No, it's because I'm eternally optimistic that something good might happen. You know, it's like I'm always looking. Okay. I'm like, maybe. I mean, because look, here, Dana Bash and, and Jake Tapper, I was talking about this earlier with Joe Concha. Uh, the two of them moderated the debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And the wonderful thing about that debate is they pulled themselves out of it. They just asked the questions and then they sat back and let the two men speak. It ended up being uh, great, useful for for the political conversation. Uh, it was the mo that was the moment Donald Trump defeated Joe Biden because Joe Biden left the race in shame as a result of all of that. Uh, so I, I saw that and I said, well, her track record includes at least one good event. It does. They actually in in, in that debate, uh, and I happily concede that because I agree fully. In that debate, I think they did a really good job. I just. As it relates to actually sitting down and expecting Dana Bash to ask the yeah. vice president hard questions, I don't think that's going to happen. Look, if I may, yeah. I think – and you're so – actually, I think you're the best at this. I really do mean that. Whatever someone thinks, someone listening to us talking, whatever someone thinks about that, about the media bias, about some other aspect of this campaign, about the vice president not answering questions about policies and issues – for us at Heritage, it all boils down to one thing. Every single thing Vice President Kamala Harris has done, every single tie-breaking vote, every single stupid cackle has been, has been something that has undermined the American dream and our prosperity. It actually is that simple. And if Trump and Vance can simply prosecute that case— even with the bias of the media, I think they will prevail. Yeah, that's right. And her the the media posture that you're watching represents the fundamental contempt she has for the republic. The idea is uh, that if you, you know you're supposed to interface with the voters, you're supposed to answer the tough questions, you're supposed to uh, read out what your policies are, so we have a good sense of whether or not you deserve our vote. And the fact that she's trying to gloss over that. Uh, for in this very short campaign in which she was anointed to the role, appointed to the role of nominee, uh, it, it's just it's just as clear a sign as ever that they're raising a vulgar gesture to the American voter. It is, and it's utter contempt. And and for left of center friends who might be listening, I will would happily contrast what your description just now of the vice president versus President Clinton. I disagreed with Clinton as I know you did on most things, but the one thing I always respected about him was his genuine tendency to have an intellectually honest debate with someone. He was so confident in his positions and his reason that he had those policy positions, he would debate anyone anytime. Yeah. We can disagree with the outcomes of those, but you can at least respect that just a generation ago, the standard bearer for the American left didn't have that kind of contempt that she personifies every day in office. So, so Kamala Harris's positions include uh, kneecapping American energy in the past and, and, and the ones I truly believe she has, getting rid of fracking, opening up our borders, giving illegal foreign nationals all sorts of benefits, uh, defunding the police. Uh, the, the list is is endless and radical. But her, her running mate, Tim Walls, the governor of Minnesota, 
I'm struggling to figure out which one's more radical because this is the guy who supports tampons in the boys' room. He's the one who established a snitch line during COVID so that neighbors could rat their uh, rat their other neighbors out uh, to the uh, the Soviets in Minnesota about you know whether or not they were abiding by COVID rules. He deployed the National Guard to shoot people on their porch with paintball guns during the George Floyd riots. I I just I'm just trying to figure out in your view as a as a policy guy, do you know who's more radical on that on this ticket? Actually, purely from a policy point of view, I don't know, because the, the examples that you mentioned of Governor Walls, along with some other aspects of his administration, are just as bad. And in a lot of ways, if you think about the power that a state government has over you in your day to day life, it, it, it's a different kind of power, thankfully, than the federal government. During COVID, the worst governors, and he was certainly at the top of the list, really abused that power during the George Floyd riots he did. And so in terms of how a an elected official can harm you in your day-to-day existence, we saw the worst of that during the COVID shutdowns. He actually was the worst. He was worse than Gretchen Whitmer. And so it really is hard to answer the question, is Tim Walz or Kamala Harris more dangerously liberal? Yeah, well, I don't think CNN asked. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that comes up tonight. Hey, which one of you is worse? I, I'm pretty sure that's not on the menu. Uh, Kevin Roberts from the Heritage Foundation and the host, by the way, of the Kevin Roberts Show. Great, great podcast. Kevin, great to talk to you as always, sir. Hey, uh, some uh, encouraging news in terms of the polling. If you like President Trump, well, Nate Silver is predicting today that President Trump once again has a majority chance of winning this election. He puts it at 52.4% as opposed to Harris's 47.3%. Again, he's handicapping the percentage chance that they would win. So that's virtually a coin flip. It's a weighted coin. It's it's tilting towards Trump. Uh, but there's Nate Silver today saying that. And he says the reason for that is because Pennsylvania is not looking good for Kamala Harris right now. That There's a number of surveys that are coming out post-convention surveys that demonstrate that uh, she is very weak there, uh, weaker than the Democrats are hoping. Um, They said, uh, he said, today we added one post-DNC poll showing Pennsylvania as a tie and another that was conducted during the during the convention, the Democratic convention, showing either a tie or Trump plus one, depending on what version you prefer. He said their model Nate Silver's model puts a lot of weight on this recent data because of all the changes in the race. And you can see why it thinks this is a problem for her. If she's only tied in Pennsylvania now during what should be one of her stronger polling periods, that implies being a slight underdog come November. So that's uh, the look forward there. Also, uh, Mark Halperin, remember his name, the political commentator? Uh, He's posted, I think this is his podcast. This is just his own commentary. Uh, saying that if you're rooting for Kamala, things are not looking great right now. There's some public polling already. There's more coming. And there's some private polling that suggests that nationally in the battleground states, she's not ahead. She might be ahead on paper, but well within the margin of error. And there's some battleground states now where I think Donald Trump's on this trajectory is going to be ahead. And it may be regardless of what happens in the interview and regardless what happens in the debate, it may be that by the middle of September, when things have calmed down, when the Trump campaign have had time to prey on some of the weaknesses that I suggested, that he's ahead in all the Sunbelt states and ahead in Pennsylvania and competitive in Michigan and Wisconsin, which would be roughly where Joe Biden was before the debate with a single path the 270 electoral votes, the three Great Lake states in Nebraska, too. And that would be a scary position for the Democratic Party to be in from mid-September through Election Day. So uh, so if you heard him there at the end, I think that's the key, is that Democrats w- are, are are heading in the direction right now where they'll only have a single path to 270, which is, you know, of course, the number of electoral votes you need to win. Uh, Wisconsin right now looks a little soft in the polling for Trump. That seems to be an area where he's going to want to concentrate a lot more of his energy, assuming that that's what she needed to do, just put the rallies there and uh, maybe get uh, uh, some more support there. Uh, Hillary Clinton would be familiar with this phenomenon. <laughs> Turns out going to Wisconsin might, might improve your odds. Uh, if you skip it, maybe you'll lose it. And by extension, the entire presidency... <laughs> Uh, she doesn't talk about that, though. She blamed Russia for that one. Oh, and that's right. Women. Women uh, who are married. She blamed them, too. Who else did she blame? 
She blamed a lot of She blamed Trump. She blamed Russia. She blamed women. She blamed James Comey. She, it's a long list. Too long for me to go over right now. Uh, hey, the great one, Mark Levin, is coming up next here on WMAL. Uh, just like Chris Plant said, we'll cover the craziness of this Kamala Harris interview on CNN. It doesn't look like they're going to really drill down for the details.